Okay, and welcome to everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone who has joined us today on the Enterprise Corner as we go through uh, as we go through value creation. Uh, welcome to everyone. I think we will be seeing some of you coming in. We know it's World Cup Day, so <laughs> we are, we we are conscious of that, uh, as our audience probably is. Um, but to those of you who will probably catch us the next day um, on the other side, welcome to you too. If you can, just give it a sh give us a shout uh, where you're joining us from, uh, and also some of your thoughts today on value creation. Uh, I think this is going to be a deep conversation for everyone um, because it is it is it is that time uh, towards the end of the year where people are trying to look at where their businesses are going, what kind of customers you're trying to attract, and what you are trying to sell. Um, this is a key thing today for you all who are with us. Please join us in um, join us more in a capacity of note taking. Today is a very strong uh, it's a very strong session in terms of technicality. So this is the very technical side uh, rather than just the inspirational sides that sometimes we have been following. So you're going to be dealing with two very good models. So what we're going to go through today is the six dimensions of value. Uh, we have to talk about that. What is value? Uh, we're also going to go through Porter's Michael Porter's five forces and what are the core elements of the core forces themselves. So the, the, uh, sorry, Michael Michael Porter's value chain and the five elements of it. We're going to talk about four components that you should be working on in each of those value chains. We're also going to talk about the five forces model, um, which also is the environment that you work on in that same value chain. Then we're going to end today with a few case studies uh, and case studies to try and help you understand how to apply this also as your business as well, because that's it's very important to learn how to apply concepts, not just to learn and memorize concepts, but for the very important task of learning how to apply concepts and how to use them strategically as tools. So as we said to everyone, please take out your notepads. It's actually quite important today because these are thing to not just memorize, but and not just for discussion points, but for that. But Shadrach, um, before we get started, our usual pleasantries, how are you doing, my brother? And how has your week been? Fantastic. Uh, the week is, uh, well, I think the week is cool. <laughs> <laughs> the week is fantastic. You see, I've, I've been having a very busy week. So I'm not sure if it's, it's, it's been very nice, but um, I think it's fantastic. Business was it's okay. Yeah, just, you know, I've been interested, man. I'm tired. Okay. But anyway, That's time is good. <laughs> <laughs> there are people who are tired of not having business. That's what they have. There are people who are tired of not having business. So just remember, it's good to be tired from your business, not good to Very be tired much. from no business. Or yeah, people get yeah, tired, tired from looking good. for money. <laughs> no, that's good. That's fantastic. All right. Yeah. So Kenny should be joining us sometime. Uh, if not, unfortunately... Kenny has, uh, he's, look, he's going through a period where he's also getting very busy, people. So we kind of just uh, leave the door open for our brother when and when he pitches up. Uh, <laughs> but we have left him some notification mm -hmm. of that. So today, Shadrach, our conversation, the aim of today's conversation, people, and as we said, give us a shout in the comments uh, if you're with us. But the aim of today's conversation is to, to kind of get you to understand where does value come from? How do you develop it? How do you manage it? Um, how do you how do you deal with it? Like value is an extremely important concept you really want to have dealt with uh, over a period of time. And value is what gets you paid. That's what I want as many of you to recognize. Value is what gets you paid. Your customers will pay you because of the amount of value that you're going to be delivering to them. And often they'll find that the price of which you are offering is often a fraction of the value they are perceived to be receiving. Okay, that's what, that's what a happy customer is. A happy customer is a person who feels like they've gotten two times the value than the price that they're paying. So if they're looking at something as 100 kwacha, they're thinking, wow, this is 300 kwacha almost worth to me. The joy and the, 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 the speed at which it's been given to me. So the first thing I wanted to look at is the dimensions of value. And I want everyone to, to kind of write these ones down. And value is just simply your ability to do something, make something, sell something, uh, create something, manage something, communicate something. It's about, it's about having something done, okay? Whatever the task is, whether it's uh, creating a show or a podcast 
or it's uh, generating information and knowledge, or it's uh, making a cake, making a pie, uh, or it's uh, creating a bottle of juice, whatever it is, growing tomatoes, it is valuable because somebody somewhere is saving money, they're saving time, they're saving pain in some way, shape, or form. And what you just simply want to know is this. A person who is valuable, something that is valuable, is something that you've gotten that is, and here are the six dimensions I'll tell people, bigger, okay? In other words, you can get more of it when somebody delivers it. So it's bigger, it's better. In other words, the quality or the reliability or whatever standard of quality that you're using is better. So it's bigger, better. You deliver it faster, okay? In other words, I can get it at a much faster rate because time is of the essence, especially to a generation who is more about convenience. We like to microwave our food. We like to go into a shop and within five minutes, we can get our food out. That's what fast food has been about, especially in the restaurant business. Uh, there, there are some people who like the dining experience, but quite a lot of people, they're constrained with time. They just want to get their food and get out or consume it as quickly as possible, or we want ready to consume food. Okay, so it's bigger, better, faster, stronger. Stronger is the fourth one. We're looking for something that has less of an opportunity that when I get it from you, I get it in a way that is less likely to be risky than the other alternatives. Uh, the, yeah. I, 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 can, I can trust that the quality I'm going to get is not going to vary. So a strong, a strong brand or a strong product is not going to vary. Uh, bigger, better, faster, stronger, uh, and also simpler. Sometimes some things are very complicated. So you're offering me a simpler version, a much more simple way of doing it. Uh, let me give you a simple example. Uh, banks, unfortunately, sometimes will ask you for paperwork after paperwork after paperwork. Meanwhile, a mobile operator will say to open an account, you just need to bring your NRC and have your phone registered. Or if your phone is already registered, you can do it already. You notice that, say, simpler process. And what's happening is more people are using it because it is a simpler process. So simple is actually quite important because then you're allowing people to do things without going through learning curves, without too many mistakes, without too much error, without too much suffering. So simpler. And then finally, cheaper. If you are a small business, I would advise you to stay away from being cheaper. Uh, the reason is that being cheaper requires big supply chains, economies of scale. It requires a lot of infrastructure for you to be cheaper. Uh, cheap is very expensive for a business, very expensive. Any single movement is very difficult. You have to have a big business to be comfortable doing things cheaper because then you have to access cheaper credit. You have to have bargaining power with your suppliers. You have to have control over your consumers. You have to have control over almost every aspect. And we'll talk about that later. So being cheaper is not a good idea when you're starting your business, but you can do that later when you're bigger. But when you're, when you're smaller, I want you to focus on the first five. Bigger, better, faster, stronger, simpler. Okay? That is a reason somebody will be willing to pay you because you're offering it better than them doing it themselves, than the substitute, and also your competitors. So you must be bigger, better, faster, stronger, simpler, than self, than doing it yourself, your competitors, or any other substitutes that you can use. Shadrach, I don't know if you can uh, bring in anything from those dimensions of value. Well, I, I like I like the part you just mentioned. You know, uh, people pay for people don't pay you because you you have a nice product. No, people pay you because of value. And and I give an example, Mnyumba, uh Usually, that you know, when you are, for example, let's say you, you run a restaurant. All right. Yeah, and then you 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 charge your your food at a certain amount of money. People are not paying you uh, for that amount of money because of the person that cooked the food. No, you may have a very qualified chef, a very experienced person to cook the food, but you won't charge me more money because the person that cooked is very experienced, is very qualified. No, I'm not paying for your qualification. What I'm paying for is the taste that I'm going to get from the food. Right. So as a business owner, you must understand what value are you giving your clients that is going to force them to pay more. When you go to Hungry Lion, they tell you that, um, do you want big chips? Do you want large? Do you want what? So, so it's like for, for every coin you spend, there's additional value. Why do you pay for large extra, whatever it is? Because of the perceived value that you feel, okay, if I pay for large chips, the value is going to be more. If you go to the Bonilla's Pizza, they ask, do you want double, double decker, whatever that is, do you want double cheese, double what? Every single thing they top up 
is extra value for the client. So you pay more for value. You're not paying more because of the person that is putting those cheese on top of the pizza. No. So I think it's a very important concept, guys, that when you are running a business, you have to understand what value are you providing to your clients that will make the client to want to pay you more. Because I, I can eat in Shima from anywhere else. I, 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 there's a Chinese restaurant in Makeni, Minyumba. You know, when I went there, uh, no, they, they, they told me what you want. They said, I, want, I wanted fish. What do they do? They show me, they take me to this, this kapu, there's fish. They give me something like a spear. I chop one, one live fish part. They says, Chinese guy gets the fish, no, kills it there, boosts it. Does it for me. No, I, I, I enjoyed the process, all right? I had to eat the fresh fish. I did not really care about the person that was helping me catch the fish, you no, know, kill it. No, what I liked was that I'm eating a fresh fish from the, you know, from the, the pool, from the pond, fresher, much more fresher from the pond. Bah, 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 fast they give me. I ate the fish, all right. So I, I was about to pay more for that meal because of the value, not because the, of the person that cooked the fish. No, the value and the taste. It was so nice. So you have to understand what value are you adding. I think that's a very good point. Here. Good. And here's a simple thing you also have to remember. Understand what value your skills, look at your skills as an individual, or as a business. What value are you able to deliver bigger, better, faster, stronger, simpler? Okay. And also, what value does the customer most desire? Is it bigger, better, faster, stronger, cheaper? I mean, simpler. If you can find an overlap where you are very good at delivering something that the customer most desire, then you have built yourself. And remember, it must be simpler than your, your competition, the customer doing it themselves, and substitutes. Okay? And there are other there are substitutes. Because Shadrach can say, I wanted fish. Maybe he can say, instead of fish, I wanted chicken. Maybe that's a substitute meal he wanted that yeah. day. Which, which what was the substitute to that meal? What was the substitute to that product? So always yeah. look at competitors, self manage self doing it, and substitutes. Okay, these yeah. are the real reason somebody wants to do something. So people value because the reality that you have to understand is people value their time and they value yeah. their emotions. Okay, yeah. So if you can give them an emotional experience, Shadrach was talking about sitting there watching someone chopping fish for him and everything. That's an emotional experience. It's interesting. It's it it lights him up. It's an enjoyable experience. And it made it wasn't just he wasn't just eating fish. He was eating a, he was eating fish in a way that made him feel happy. Okay. So that happiness was actually what he derived from the eating of that fish. So that happiness is an emotion he's willing to place value to. So people place value on time. They place value on money, and they place value on their emotions. Okay, so that's what you're really delivering when you're doing that. Now, that, this is the fluffy side of it. Now, let's talk about the business side of it, because that's what we want all of you as entrepreneurs to do. And we promise you that today is going to be a more technical session. So for those of you who haven't done this, this is something called Michael Porter's, uh, Michael Porter's value chain. Okay, and it's actually quite a detailed thing. So we're going to try and do it as simply as possible. But this is an introduction. You're not going to be able to get this just from immediately trying to just get it here. This is not an instant thing, but it is a way that you're going to be able to understand it. So this is what we call the value chain. Okay, it's a very simplified model. Give us a shout in the comments section if you can actually see it. Uh, and that's something that you can you 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 that's something you're able to see. Give us a shout. Just just confirm if you're able to see it. Now, for the purpose of today's conversation, we're going to focus on this bottom part of the value chain. Okay, we're going to focus on this part of the value chain, which is Michael, which is the, the bottom part where it's, where it's in yellow, orange, um, and red. That part is called primary activities. I think you can see it here. That's what's called the value chain, and it's made up of five components. Okay. Now I've, I've given it a bit of a different name just so that you can remember it. And I call them the five S's. All right. So the first one is called inbound logistics. Where do you get your inputs from? If you're getting fish, where are you getting them from? If you're getting inputs to manage your fish, where are you getting them from? So inbound logistics are all the inputs that you need to produce the product, the service, whatever it is you need to do. What do you need to get? So that you can so that you're able to create and deliver your product or service, and this is quite important. This is your supply chain management uh, component. That's what it's called. So I call this sourcing. Okay, the first one is to source. That's called inbound logistics. 
Operations is what I call solve. This is processing. What are the things you need to be doing in order to develop your product? Okay, whatever service, your product, whatever it is. So know your product. You know what it is. So now you're trying to figure out how to deliver it or how to create it. So you have to create a product, create a service, whatever it is. You are transforming inputs to create a product. These are called operations here. Yeah? I call this solving because this is where you're solving a problem. You're getting these inputs to create the solution for the customer's problem. Okay, so you source and then you solve. The third one is outbound logistics. How do I get my product or my service from where I am? I've solved it. How do I get it to my customer? This is your distribution network. This is how you get it out. Are you getting it through wholesalers? Are you getting it direct to consumer? What other things you're working on? What strengths do you have? Okay. And so this is sourcing. All right. I'm sorry. This is, this is, uh, this is what we call uh, sending. So you, you source, you solve, you send. Okay, because you have to get it from you get have to get it from your your warehouse or your business or wherever to your customer. So how do you send it to your customer? Okay, how does the product get there? The next one is called sales. You're trying to market or sell it. How do you get new customers to be aware of it? There's something here in sales I call the 6S model. Okay, and 6S model just stands for a process of how you get someone to advertise and stay with you. Now, I, all I ask is, how do you get a customer? It's, it's basically these. C, signal, uh, start, stay, spend, sell. Okay? These are phases that a customer will go through. Okay? I want someone to write that down in the comment section. C, signal, start, stay, spend, sell. And simply, how do you get a new customer to see you? Okay. How are your adverts working? How do new people see you? How do you get them to signal that they're interested in you? Okay. Because you want people who are signaling interest, not people who are, who are not happy with you. You want people who signal interest. You want people to then start. How do they say, okay, I'm interested. Can I start? How do I start? So get to the process of how they can start. You want a little friction. How do they stay? How do they come back the next time? Because you don't want people to just be one time with you. You want people to come over and over and do business with you. That person who did that fish for Shadrach wants Shadrach to have such a good experience that Shadrach comes back over and over again. And this time, Shadrach spends more money now. How do you get them to continuously spend money with you? And then finally, sell. How do you get them to tell your friends? So the first one, C, signal, start. That's advertising, okay? Now, stay, spend, and sell, that's customer relations. So you want to break those two parts away. So it's C, signal, stay, uh, C, signal, start, stay, spend, sell. And that's how you deal with your sales and customer relations, which is part of this. Because the good thing about customers who keep coming back that person who gave Shadrach that wonderful service doesn't have to come back and advertise to him again. The memory of that fish is advertising to Shadrach and Shadrach wants to go back and get some more. Okay. So he's not spending any more money advertising to Shadrach. Then Shadrach, because of how much he enjoyed it, is also going to go and tell his friends. Okay. Shadrach is going to go and tell his friends as to how he got that service and he was really enjoying it. Uh, and then his friends who trust Shadrach are going to say, well, I trust Shadrach not to lie to me. So let me go and try it. The number one form of advertising people, sorry, just to introduce is, is a, a recommendation. A personal recommendation is the best form of advertising. Everything yeah. else met with skepticism, but a recommendation. And finally, service. Do you have after-sales service? Do you have on-sales service? What are you doing to serve your clients? How are you serving them? So these are the things, interacting with them in order to deliver the service and actually having that point of interaction with them. That's a very important point because that's where the actual product is transacted. That's where the product is given. That's where the product meets its need. So these are the processes you need to go through. And then you add something called a margin. Now, this margin that you're seeing here, this green part, this is, the, this is the price buffer. This is your profit. It comes from you being able to do it bigger, better, faster, stronger. So you people pay this extra margin. Shadrach knows that he doesn't have a fish pond at his house. He doesn't have the skills to do this thing, uh, to, do, to do fish that fresh. He knows that. So he's paying because somebody else has trained to get those skills 
And that margin is to support that person who's doing that. It's paying for those skills now. I'm paying for a person who can do it better than I can, or than I can find it anywhere else, bigger, better, faster, stronger, cheaper, or simpler than I can do it myself or find it elsewhere. So this is an introduction. Now, this part at the top here, th this is what we call sustaining value, but we'll talk about that later. So this, this is, an, this is, we'll talk about that at another point. Today, we're going to focus on this core part here, because when you're starting your business, you must focus first before you start having procurement departments, technology, HR, firm infrastructure, accounting systems. Uh, you do need a basic one, people. But before you start thinking about all of that, you need to be able to bring in inputs, solve. So remember, you have to be able to source, solve, send, sell and serve. You have to be able to do these five S's, which then gives you this extra margin if you can do it bigger, better, faster, stronger, cheaper, simpler than the, than the person or the competition. Shadrach, I hand it to you so that we can kind of switch to anyone and hopefully people are kind of keeping up on this part. Yeah, this is this is a very good model, guys. And let me know by saying, you, you know, if, if you look at the, these, uh, the core parts of the value chain, you know, my personal favorite member is the after sale, the after sale service. I, I love the, the after sale service. Do you know why? This one, the one that says markets, marketing and sales. Now, on marketing and sales, we have uh, marketing and sales and the service. Now, on service, here, there's something called after sale service. Yeah. All right. When you go to Toyota Zambia today, you buy a vehicle. What Toyota Zambia does every month, they will give you a call and they, they ask you, Hey, Minumba, how are you finding our 2020 highlights? How is it? Do you like the experience? Mm -hmm. Do you have any problems? If you have any problems, you tell them, they quickly send somebody to pick up the vehicle. They ask you to please come through to our, you know, our, our service center. We'll come and take your vehicle. So they have this, this service sale, that, that this after sale service, that you just feel that people care about you. So the reason why people keep going back to Dr. Zamba to buy vehicles is because of the service that they keep receiving even after you've purchased the vehicle. You can't behave like a conductor when, you know, when you are going to town. <laughs> they say, town, town, they stop anywhere, all right? Once you are in that vehicle, there's no respect. They can even insult you, all right? Mm. They can fight you. So, so they, they don't have the after sale service. For them, once they get money from you, you are nothing. But for you to survive as a business, I remember I was saying, how do you make people stay with you? Remember, I run a school. I have people that have stayed with me from inception. I have people that are doing with, uh, that are doing with my platform for a master's level, a lot of them. Some of them say from the scratch, from level one, up to degree, up to master's. I'm still lecturing these students. Do you know why some people have stayed because of the service that they receive, even away from school, all right? We can interact. I help them uh, with uh, getting jobs. I have helped a lot of students to get employed in this country. All right. So there's also this thing of just the service after you learn some. Sometimes I call them, how did you find the session? What is it? Is there anything that we can do better? So because of the service that we keep providing, people keep on staying. So guys, if you're going to be successful, you have to understand. All right. Like Mnumba said, look at inbound logistics here. All right. This is like, like the, uh, the art of your business. Because most of you, when you're starting, you want to, to, to use a very wrong strategy, that's penetration strategy, which is a very bad strategy to use when you're starting. Like we were saying, you can't be cheaper when you're just starting. Come on, you, you need money. So how do you start giving out money? There are two, two somebody would argue and say, but we've seen some companies come, come on board with cheaper strategy. Like for example, we saw young or recently coming on board with a very uh, ridiculous uh, you know, uh, strategy. That is it's changed strategy. already. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What did they do? So they had bought it for a certain amount of money to lose for a period of maybe three months or so, whatever months it was, to get the attention of people. Once people knew about them, what did they do? They changed. Now it's almost the same as, as Ulendo. All right. Mm -hmm. So so that strategy, they were willing to lose out a certain amount of money when they were starting. So you ask yourself a question. If you're going to go the cheaper way, how much are you willing to lose? A good salesman, a good investor does not lose money unnecessarily unless you're just going to come back to it. All right, so this is the part you don't want to mess up, the inbound logistics, because they're talking about how do you receive your raw materials, how do you handle storing inputs, all those kinds of stuff, even rentals for under this first part here. Because some, some of you when you're starting, I want, I want a very nice place. Then you are paying a lot of money on rentals, uh, electricity, a lot of expenses at the start. In the end, you can't see the margins because the expenses are outweighing 
the, what, what the value people are paying for. So unless your value is so much that people are willing to pay an extra amount, then you can do a lot of stuff at, 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 at the inception. But before you go anywhere, guys, please remember inbound logistics is like one of the most important. If you get this one right, your business is on track uh, to single eyes. And uh, uh, of course, um, numbers with the tackle on operations, outbound logistics, marketing and sales, and also after sales service. So create a relationship with your customers, all right? So once you, you, you can manage your costs here, because what makes you... Number mentioned the word when we said economies of scale. And let me explain this, guys. When we say economies of scale, here's what, what, what happens. I order things online, all right? If you order one laptop, all right, you still be able to pay about 520 quarter, all right? If you order 10 laptops, because when you're, when you're, when you're buying online, they charge you per gram when, when they are shipping those items. So if you have five, if, if between one gram to five grams, you're going to pay, say, 500. Between uh, 1.5 grams to 3.5 grams, you're going to pay 1,000. So if you buy one laptop, for example, it is 40, maybe it is maybe 1.5 grams. You're still going to pay 3.5 because it's within that ratio. But yeah. if you buy 10 laptops and they are falling within 3.5 grams, you still be able to pay the same amount of 1,000. So it's 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 it, that's where the economy of scale are coming from. You are spending less because you are buying more. So that gives unit, you a yeah. chance to charge less. Have you seen? So if you buy one laptop, shipping is to pay 1,000 because it's falling within 1 to 3.5. But if you buy 10 laptops and they are falling within 1 to 3.5, you still pay the same amount of money for shipping. So you, you are spending more on one laptop to ship it. I am spending less for shipping how much? 10 laptops. So my economies of scale are coming that I'm buying more, so I'm spending less per unit. So I have the, the, the ability to reduce prices, not you who's just starting. Because for you, you are losing money, my friend. Right, that's what economies of scale mean. So when you are starting, you don't have economies of scale. You can't become the cheaper way. All right, you have to go with the, the scheming way. That's a story for another day. I think remember it's, it's been very very clear. And, and I hope guys are taking notes. This is a very important session that uh, you know you want to make sure when you are starting your business. This is the part you have to get it right. This is where bankruptcy this, happens. <laughs> this, this is the part you have to get it right. There's something called the critical success factor. Something you must do right for you to succeed. And if you mess it up here when you are starting, guys, everything is going to be um, uh, out of your league. And there's, there's a point, remember, that at, at some point I'm going to want to share with our friends here with, uh, on outbound, uh, inbound uh, logistics. All right. Here, uh, there's something that I add as an addition. Uh, and this is something, uh, are you able to see my screen? Because I can't see my screen. Okay, let me just remove this one so that you're free to share this one. All right, so there's something that I'd like to show you quickly that you must do right when you're starting, guys. You must do this one right uh, when you're starting. You can't afford to mess this thing up when you're starting. So there we go. I'm sharing some notes here. All right, uh, please tell me if you can see them. Yes, we can. All right, so... It is at inception there where you also have got to understand this total risk here. All right. So some, some people, when they are starting, like I was saying, they are uh, you're talking about the inbound logistics. They're talking about how you're receiving those uh, 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 raw materials, how you're handling them, how you're storing them, how you're storing the inputs, you know, warehousing, transportation, inventory control management. They are all happening at inception, inbound logistics, your core area. So it is that same part where you're supposed to, uh, to understand what risk are you facing. Because if you don't understand the risks at inception there, you are going to lose. So there's something called unsystematic risk, and then there's something called systematic risk. So we combine this with the value chain to help you understand the risks that is associated to your business. So for example, there's something called company-specific uh, uh, risk. This is what we call unsystematic risk. For example, if you're a restaurant, what are the risks that are specific to your industry? You may be in hospitality industry, you run a hotel or you run this a chain of restaurants. You know, usually inventories they go obsolete here. If you buy food, meat, milk, those things are perishable uh, items. So you have to understand how do you reduce that risk at inception? Because there are some factors you can't control. Systematically, for example, prices in the markets. You can't control those ones. You can't eliminate those ones, but you reduce the, 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 the losses on your business by managing unsystematic risks, risks associated specifically to your business at inception there, all right? So I'm not going to go into details of uh, diversification and stuff like that, but I just want to point out to you that when you are starting, it's at that point in that box where it says, 
inbound logistics where you must be able to understand your unsystematic risk and manage it from there. Remember, I think I'd like you to bring back your diagram so that I can point out uh, this point from there. Yeah, because I want there's something I wanted to add also to it. Yes, but continue. Yes. So now, so now here, guys, if you see that box, the inbound logistics, that's the part where you must understand the systematic risk and the unsystematic risk. Unsystematic risk, you have no control. All right, you can't do anything about it. But here, you have control. See what happens. Here. This is the part where I'm talking about how you're receiving your materials. How are you handling and storing your inputs uh, to the production system? That uh, we can talk about warehousing transportation, inventory control, you know, rentals, all these things are happening here. So you have to understand what is going to, what, what can go wrong at that particular part so that you can reduce the costs at inception. Once the costs are reduced, your operations are going to fall, uh, to fall into play because operations are not just converting resources, uh, that is the raw materials into finished goods. So here, there's not much problem, but the issue, sort out your things here. What type of inventories are you, are you, are you dealing with? Um, Mm. Let me let me oh, add something, Shadrach. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, it's here. You're, you're not able to see? Or, okay, okay. I, I think you can continue. I think I'll pick it up later. So let me just add something to this. The question we often get along this point is, these are five things to manage. These are five yeah. things you have to be able to do. And, you know, it's, it's very difficult to do things all together at the beginning. It can be difficult. So here's yeah. what I suggest to as many people. Find one part to do, okay? Yeah. Find one part of this value chain you do very well. And the most likely part I will even suggest to a person to do is actually starting here at sales and marketing yeah. and service. You know why yeah. I say this? A yeah. lot of people build products that people don't want. And they yeah. end up with an inventory pileup. That's your biggest risk when you're a small business. Inventory pileup. That is the most dangerous thing that can happen to you. And that's where a lot of businesses um, end up end up, end up, up shutting down at the beginning. It's because of, unfortunately, inventory pileups. So to get rid of the inventory pileup problem, you either want to get work experience or start as an agent in the product. Okay, direct yeah. sales agent or something. And here's the reason why. You get information about the consumer. You actually learn yeah. the consumer's needs and then you yeah. build the product around your knowledge of the consumer's needs. I want everyone here, just guys in the comment section, how many of you started in sales in whatever industry you're in or you are in right now? How many of you, please put in the comment section, just with a, hat, with a show of hands, how many of you are in the sales component of your business? And I want to tell you something about sales. A lot of people are blind with sales where they treat sales as ah, it's just something I do to make money. Actually, people, sales is not just money. It's a gold mine of information. I yeah. used to work on the back ends of, uh, of the stock markets, and I understood things a little bit, you know. But when I started working on the front end, when I started engaging directly with customers, not where I was a researcher and I was working on the, in the back end and business development, those areas. When I started working as the front end, where I was actually doing client services, I now understood the needs of the client. When I was there, then that's when I could understand, okay, so this is where, when, when me and Matthew even started in bond trading before, a long time in, one, in, one, in another entity, we learned where the problems for a client to trade bonds on the secondary market was. And that's why we created this pipeline for people to get to the primary market. But it started by learning the sales process. So if you understand the sales component of what you're doing, okay, oh. if you understand marketing, sales, and service. So here's my suggestion to anyone. Start by selling finished products, okay? You know that even um, if you, anyone has noticed, our friends at Ulendo have even started an Ulendo restaurant. After doing Ulendo Eats, where they were delivering people's food, guess what they got? Information. The person who has the most information about the industry is actually the salesperson. The salesperson knows the costs of the products, while they also know the costs and the willingness of what the customer wants to buy. So because of that knowledge in sales, you are actually able to now say, let me now design the product. Because I can see what are my customers constantly complaining about here when you're talking about after sales service. You are the one who gets to know what the customers are complaining about. You are the one who gets to understand what the customers are really happy with. So you know exactly what to build and what skill yeah. sets are around before you go around investing in inbound logistics. The mistake yeah. I've seen with many businesses 
is they start investing in operations and inbound logistics, which then becomes wrong because they start serving the wrong product. They don't yeah. make any sales. Yeah. They have to scrap these inbound logistics, start again. Now they're in yeah. debt. They have to hike their prices. They're struggling to pay a loan and out of business. This yeah. is what I mean by you go out of business if you don't manage yeah. properly. So the cheapest yeah. way to start any business is to start in serving and selling because you get to know the customer. You actually get to know the customer when you're serving and selling to them. Sell them finished products. The person who's actually at a, if you work as a mobile operator booth, at a booth, you get to know what people are busy, what, what they're transacting. You know why they're coming to your booth. You know what they're doing. You know where the booth operations sometimes are going wrong. You know what it is that needs to be improved better. So then the person who's sitting at a booth, if you are alert, you actually can learn to start seeing the business opportunities in mobile technology. Then you can start saying, let me start learning how to build a solution. So if anybody, yeah. I urge you, start by selling and then work your way backwards to this. Okay, sell, then maybe do the outbound logistics and the sales, then do the operations. Now, let me tell you something, Shadrach. Do you know who did that yeah. in Zambian history? Trade Kings. Mm -hmm. Trade Kings started by selling <laughs> yeah. products. Yeah, yeah, and you yeah. Actually learn. They, they started by selling products. Once they learned what the customers wanted, they started now distributing products. Then once they got that even better, they started manufacturing. Now they're even going to the point where they're even grabbing some farms if they have to, because they'll know what's important. So start by serving and selling. Then yeah. you know, even at a restaurant, uh, you, if you are the if you are the person who's serving people food, you know what food is ordered the most. You are the most if you are alert, if you are sharp, you actually can pick up that. Okay, this is what people order the most. These are the meals that are the yeah. most in demand. This is the stuff they enjoy the most. This is the stuff that they don't like the most. You have information. So people yeah. get into sales positions. If you want to be an entrepreneur. Go and find a job or a gig or something in a sales position of the industry you want to join. You will learn the customer. And then from there, you can build the product that beats the market. I don't know Munyumba, what you thought. Munyumba, Munyumba, you've done a fantastic job. And, and guys, I want to, what Munyumba is saying is extremely fantastic. That's the point. And just, just to add on that one, I want to show you a book that has really changed my game. I've kept this book for years, guys. <laughs> and book. I've still got it, yeah. I have kept this book for years. You can see what, what it looks like. This is a book by, um, see, see the name? Susan. See, see this Susan. wonderful name here? Susan Mwenda Mulongoti. Guys, every time I, I, I'm reading this book for the seventh time this week, mm. all right? I'm reading this book for the seventh time. And I can assure you that what, what I'm explaining and what we're taking from this very chain, Susan has put that information in a layman's language in a book. Right, and and if you go to chapter five, she asks a question. Says uh -huh. they have decided to buy. Now what? That's the question she asks. All right, guys, if you read this book, your selling skills will not be the same. And let me give you just a jong of what Susan says here. Susan says this. She says that uh, when customers have decided to buy from you, you have you have you have, you have a job. Okay, but because you have to get them to return, you have to get them to come back. You have to reward them to come back with friends and ascend them mm. or lose because we all want to grow. Now, here's what she says. She says, on a scale of 0 to 10, your aim should be to deliver at world-class level. What does that mean in your business? How good are you really at what you do? Do you aim to be the best in your field? And then she says, being excellent in your business is what will ensure the customer comes back. And they come back with friends and family. I like that point. And she exactly. says, you, you will get all this extra business without trouble of re-advertising. However, if you do a less than satisfactory job, there is what, here is what your loss looks like. And Susan puts it this way. And I love how she puts it. She says, she says, you, you, you have, number one, you have lost the resources you spend to get this individual because you advertise, you spend money, but also you have created bad will. If, now, what, what, what she means, she means if you sell, you don't do a good job to, to one client, the chances are that they're going to tell 12 more people about how bad you are, all right? If you do a good service, they're going to tell their friends and things like that. So she tells you, you have created a bad will here. And then she says, they will say something negative to at least 10 of their friends and family about you because you did a yeah. bad job. So you also have lost so much potential business that could have come through repeat, repeat sales and referrals. 
So she says, in conclusion, when you deliver at average, people become more price sensitive. Whereas when you wow them, a higher price feels more justified. More justified, guys. What could be better advice than that for somebody who's doing sales? Guys, this is a game changer. Please read this True. book. Two ninety-five quarter well spent. Yeah, it's, it's transforming you, 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 of. Yeah. So, so this is this is what Mumba is saying there when you say you have to focus on sales and service because now people are more likely to come back when they enjoy the service. I enjoyed the fish. And you see, I talk about Susan the way I talk about Susan because I've enjoyed her service, guys. I, I see value every time I read this book. I learn a lot. I benefit. I made my first 100,000 quacha online. And I can tell you guys, some of the things that, are, that, that helped me a lot were lessons from this book. All right? And I keep making money every single time because I've learned how to sell. I have always been a good salesman. But this lady coming in my life, she came as a mentor. That was she's she, she's mentored me from a distance how to make so how to cross deals and and the presentations. She talks about your personal behavior. How do you present yourself? So she's explained these things very well. Guys, please get this book. And that's the part number was saying that if you can sell and do a fantastic job, then you're going to have repeated sales coming back into your life. All right, and that's and, what and it means. So let, let's even talk about this thing that you've just talked about. I want to I want to add a model here from Google. I'm yeah. sorry just to add this. Yeah. This is from Google where they talk yeah. about user experience. And I hope you can see this. Yeah. Google has, um, this is something called user interface versus user yeah. experience. There's seven elements. Yeah. A lot of us yeah. like to focus on the user interface, but the user experience is what emotions the person has when yeah. they take in the product or when they use the product or the service. By reading that book, Shadrach has found it very useful. He's found yeah. it valuable. He's found it credible. So if you look here, there are seven elements of what they're looking for when somebody gets it. Useful, satisfiable, convenient, credible, desirable, accessible, valuable. These are the things you want your customer to say okay, about you. You want them to be able to say, and, the, and you're able to do all... Any one of these, bigger, better, faster, stronger, cheaper, simpler, but obviously cheaper, as I said, avoid that at the beginning, but simpler than any other of your competition yeah. or them doing it yeah. yourself. Susan's book, for example, for me, there was a lot of research I had to start doing, learning curve mistakes. She spared me some of the mistakes okay, yeah. by yeah. offering me yeah. her expert guidance. And it's the same thing that we even do in our services. Shadrach will spare you some of the mistakes that you'll make in your life, in your personal finance, by offering yeah. you expert guidance and a plan. I spare yeah. you some of the learning curves. So that's what people do. That's what value is. Uh, yeah. the, Deepak Mahotra, the, um, the, the, the Harvard uh, uh, what's it, negotiation specialist, he says, the more your customer talks about price, the less they're focusing on value. And your yes. job is to bring value back to the center of the conversation. Vusi Tembakwaya gave a, f a perfect example of a lady who charged 800 rand to do uh, manicure and, um, and makeup uh, and hair for a lady, for another lady. And she says, but some people say it's expensive. So it's like Vusi Tembakwaya told her, I said, okay, where is she going? It's like, where's the customer going? She said, okay, what if she's going to a wedding? Tell the woman, what if your ex is there? What if your ex is at that wedding? How much is it valuable to you for your ex to see you in the best look that he's ever, for him to drop his jaw and to regret that he left you? How much is that valuable to you? Then you start to see that the value to that customer now, it starts becoming more emotional. Because here's the trick, people. You have to also learn, when you're selling, you have to learn to understand human emotions. Because yeah. sales yeah. decisions are driven by human emotions. People yeah. have a pain yeah. that they are going through emotionally that they would like alleviated in order for yeah. a person to purchase the, the product that they want from you. So yeah. if you can understand the psychology of your customer, because here's yeah. the problem that you may find. And I, and I, and I want to explain this to people as simple as possible. Here's the problem a lot of you may find. You may find you've gone and, got, you've gone and invested in inbound logistics that may yeah. help your fish taste fresher. Okay. But what yeah. if your customers want it spicier? Fantastic. You see the difference. You've gone to invest in freshness when they wanted spice. Okay. Yeah. And that's what they're looking for. They're coming for a spicy uh, or a different taste. What if you're yeah. busy investing in freshness and storage in your inbound logistics when your customers are like hungry lion customers who want their, who are come there for speed? What if they've come there and they want their meal in five minutes? 
Okay, that's a different type of logistic you should be looking at. So you have to be very careful to make sure that you get the specifications that your customer is mostly emotionally satisfied with. Then you build yes. the product according to that. That's why I said get a job selling first. Get a gig or start your business by just being a distributor first. Learn what's going on. Do you know people, why, why companies like ShopRite now have their own brands of juice or Pick and Pay have their own brands of juice? It's simply because they've been monitoring what people are buying. When they see people buying, all oh, these brands of juice are there. Do you know, have you noticed that every shop first starts by selling brands? Then have you noticed they sneak in an in-store brand? That in-store brand comes as a, res as a result of them learning all the information. Yeah. That's why I yeah. said even Ulendo has started an Ulendo restaurant. Guess where they got the information about what to put on their menu? From all the food they were delivering on Ulendo Eats. Yes, they were gathering they were, data. They were, they were gathering data. So if you are a salesperson, my greatest advice to you is use that as a data gathering opportunity. Learn yeah. the customer, yeah. build the product, and then make it better from there. So start your business in sales first. Because there's no business anyway without sales. There's no business. You can make a phenomenal product, but if you can't sell it, what's the use? What's the yeah. use of if you can't sell a product? So, you, so sell first, then build a better product from the sales part backwards. So I just wanted to put that out for people. Now, there, there are four components I just wanted to add to this, uh, to this, to this, to these five forces, um, uh, which I just wanted to put in for everyone. So for each of these things, be it inbound logistics, operations, all of them, you need to be yeah. able to one set a level of uh, expectations. What are the yeah. standards you want to reach on each of them? Whether it's inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing and sales and service, set standards, okay, that you need to yeah. reach in order to deliver a good service. Because remember, yeah. a customer who has a good user experience comes back and comes back with friends. Trust me, people, a recommendation is one of the best things in the world. Because you don't yeah. have to spend money advertising. And by the time that person has called you from that recommendation, they are sold. They're already, they're already ready to yeah. buy. The second thing you yeah. want to do is to then assign, uh, is then to set processes. What processes do you have to enact in order to get to yeah. that standard? What are the things yeah. you have to do? So lay it down in terms of habits and processes for you to be able, in terms of your inbound logistics, what are the daily, weekly, monthly, you have to tr put these down. The next thing you want to do is then assign responsibilities. Who is supposed to be doing this? Okay, who is responsible for this? Write and document these down. And then what you want to be able to do is to set up systems. Whether the systems are Excel, whether they're manual, whatever, but set up systems to do two things, to be able to consistently do the activity and to track the activity because data is king, people. The most important thing you can have about your business is data. You know that data itself has become an industry and people are getting paid for data and analytics now. So your data inside your business, the data on your customers, the age of your customers, the marital status of your customers, do they have children? Do they not? Are they college educated? Do they not? What yeah. languages? That yeah. stuff is important because your marketing yeah. messaging can be improved. Your product packaging can be improved to emotionally connect. So collect yeah. data, people, data on yeah. your vendors, data on everything. So before you bring in all this, First, collect data on customers, then collect data on products and competitors, then collect data on even vendors. Where can you get the best ones? So this is what I want yeah. you all to understand when yeah. dealing with this as a process is there are four elements. Just please write this down again, people. Set standards. Number two, uh, uh, design processes and procedures. Number three, assign responsibilities. And four, yeah. design systems. If you have systems, yeah. uh, responsible people to, uh, to, 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 what's it, to operate those systems, procedures that they can follow, and standards that they're expected to meet, you will do something very important. You will meet your standards consistently. Okay? So if you can do something consistently, you know what you get from your customers? Trust. Mm -hmm. Consistency is a very important thing. Because if a customer comes back the second, third, and fourth time and gets the same service, yeah. you are now a habit for them. Now they trust yeah. you. And they're very and people are very guarded with what they trust. They tend to just stick with what they trust and then they can take the journey with you. So consistency, 
plus good delivery leads to people who stick with you and it's very hard and they are even willing to pay a premium because people will pay more for things they can trust okay mm -hmm. that's why you find that foreign high foreign more expensive pro products are selling more than local uh cheap products because people yeah. trust those products that's what you have yeah. to be able to say anyway shadrach i give that back to you Remember that that's a fantastic point, guys. Again, we get back to you know you you. This is what one thing one thing I, I always say. If you are going to succeed in your business, be a good salesperson, guys. Selling is the selling is the fundamental element of everything that happens in business. Without selling, many are nothing. Yeah. No matter how beautiful you are, handsome, you know. It's like, if a, you it's like a football team head, with no strikers. You, you can't. And yeah, yeah, yeah. What, 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 what Susan says again in this book, guys. So I'm getting a sneak peek. I'm giving you a diongo just for you to understand why I say she's put things straightforward. She says, make the process smooth. And then she, she, she asks, she says, how many steps does your customer have to go through to gather actual the, to to get the actual product? Okay. Then she asks again the question: If the process is long, tedious, boring, or complicated, you can lose the customer you have already caused. That is unwise after all the hard work of trying to get him in. Did, did, did you see that? So by making the process tedious, all right, the process by making it longer, difficult, you are wasting your time because you've put in so much marketing to, to somebody. Somebody's finally in they want to buy from you. But again, the process is too long for them to get the product. Can you make it smooth? And she gave an example of ZIA. You and I know ZIA, how it has been for the past few years. It was a mess, but now they've improved. The system is now fantastic. At least it, things are now. I'm able to do things on my own when I go to the day and I file returns. I do. But in the past, at the time Susan wrote this book, she explained the ZDA process and now uh, just how difficult it was for you to operate it on your own. It was so just I don't know how to explain it. But guys, the the, the point here is that if you are going to succeed, all right, you need to have the process simpler because you're spending so much money actually this thing. you're advertising to people you know you're putting in energy and you've done so much hard work why should you lose a client at the point of sale why make the process easier for somebody to want to buy from you i think that's a very important point guys even if you do the marketing everything is done but if the selling is longer go to ebay right now if you want to buy what happens with ebay go to ebay it's just a click, you, you are directed to the uh, checkout uh, option. You go and check out, you put in your card, you buy. Everything is there. It's so easy for you to buy something on eBay or on Amazon. It's so easy. So that's the kind of, of, of process you need to have. Something smoother that somebody want to come back. I don't have to call an expert to, to help me out to buy from your website. No, I have to do it on my own. I don't need expert noise to come and buy from your website. And that's what Susan is saying. Here. Can you make your process, guys, smooth? For other people to want to buy from you. So, guys, uh, if if and again, I recommend. You know, I've been talking about this book because it's, it's helping a lot. Buy this book and read, guys. Over to you. Bim. And by the way, there's no there's no commissions here. We're actually just giving you a recommendation because we yeah, understand yeah. what it's done for us. Um, and I'm being honest with you. There's no there's no commissions or anything that we're attaining from this. This is just a flat out recommendation to try and help you in your business process as well. Now. The, the the second the part I really I really do and I've said this before start by selling and then work your way backwards always start on the front end of a business and always work your way backwards uh, because being not being able to sell is similar to having a football team with no strikers uh, sure you can defend all you want but you win the game by scoring goals people you actually need yeah, somebody yeah. to score a goal somewhere so. It's just something that you need to work on. So even the first thing is being able to sell the product of your industry is actually the first step to actually succeeding yeah. as an entrepreneur in your industry. Uh, the book is called uh, Seven Steps to Better Sales Results by Susan Wenda Mulongoti. Someone just asked about that. So I'll just say that again. So Shadrach, maybe you can just put that in the comments section um, just yeah, for people. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, so there's the book. Uh, so there you go. That's what you can look at. There's just a light, unfortunately, glaring. That's why people aren't able to see. There it is. And it's, it's, it's so, odd because I've had it for years. Okay, so it looks a bit odd. Okay. No, no, no. Years. There was just the, the yeah. light. The light was just hitting it. So now here's the next oh, yeah. step of your of your value chain, people. Here's the other part. And just uh, if you can see this, this is very important. Michael Porter also made a second part of this called the five forces. And the five forces determine that part that says margin. How much margin, in other words, how much profit margin can you attach to your product? And these yeah. are the factors that determine how much margin you can attach to your product. And here it goes. 
uh, and it's called these are rivalry amongst competitors. So the first thing you have to look out for, and I'm going to start from here. I'm going to go anti-clockwise, as we'll say. Oh, I'm going to start from here. This is called bargaining power. Uh, oh, so let me start from here. This is called bargaining power of your buyers. Okay. So, and it looks like it looks at this. How many customers do you have? If you have a few customers, they have more bargaining power. This is why people who start doing all their business for the government go bankrupt very quickly. You've got one customer. Okay, and that customer can determine when they can pay you. They can determine how much they can pay you. They've got so much <laughs> control over you. That's why all those guys who are tenderpreneurs, they go bankrupt very quickly because they only have one customer. So when you give yeah. one customer too much power, they dictate your life. They dictate your cash flow. And that's why so many guys who are government suppliers are always saying, no, we're behind on payments. We're struggling with this because you have one customer. Then also... What is the size of each of your customers as a percentage of your total orders? So if one yeah. customer is dominating like 50, 60 percent of your business, even that is dangerous okay, for you yeah. because they are controlling you. They're controlling your price again. So if you want bargaining power, you need you don't have to have many. Or I, was, I don't have to have thousands, but just have enough so that you spread your risk because that's a risk. It's called a concentration risk. The second, the third one is the difference between uh, between you and your competitors. If you and your competitors are exactly the same to your customers, in other words, the perceived difference between you and your competitors, this is why Susan was saying, do not go in cheaper. She actually even advises that in the book, do not go in cheaper because it's dangerous. And yeah. I'll tell you this from personal experience, cheaper will destroy you at the beginning. You don't have the money for it. I've tried, there are businesses that are in the graveyard right now of, of my past which are, which are because I thought, let me go in cheaper on day one. And I've learned that lesson. Okay. So try and make sure you differentiate. What is the price sensitivity of your customers? And the and customers are often more price sensitive when you have failed to deliver bigger, better, faster, uh, simpler, stronger. When you fail to deliver in those areas, they often become much more price sensitive. Or if you're in a high inflation environment, or if you're dealing with customers who are out of your budget range. So also understand what customers are in your budget range and tailor your sales and marketing and your efforts towards them. Don't try and be for everyone. Be for the people who can afford you. Okay. Don't yeah. force yourself onto people who can't afford you. Okay. And that's also dating advice. Fantastic, now, fantastic, the other man. part is uh, buyers... <laughs> Buyers also buyers do they have do the buyers have the ability to substitute you for something else? Uh, is there an alternative product that they can utilize? So and do they know that and do they have access to it? Do buyers have the information available and do they have low switching costs? Let me give you an example. If you're trying to switch, if you let's say you've got a loan running with a bank and you want to switch that loan to another bank, what is the cost? What is the higher interest rate you'd, you'd incur from asking another bank to acquire your loan? Maybe they'll say, look, our interest rate is 5% more. That's called a switching cost. What's the cost of you switching internet service providers? Oh, I have to buy a new uh, dongle I have to, uh, or a new MiFi device. How much is that? That's called a switching cost. So if customers are in incurring low switching costs, like the cost of a SIM card, a SIM card is just a few, it's, it's, a, it's a few kwacha, and then it just takes a few minutes to activate it. That's a low switching cost. Okay. So that's what that gives your customers bargaining power. Okay. So that's number one. Bargaining power of your customers will determine how much of a margin you are able to add to your costs along your supply chain. All those activities you are doing, how much do they cost you? Then you add a margin because of your value. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. The second one you're looking for is threats of substitutes. So in other words, how many substitutes are there for you? Are there many yeah. alternatives for you? If they are, yeah. that's something you have to watch out for. That affects your ability to yeah. add a bigger margin. The second one yeah. is the buyer's propensity. Are the buyers constantly always switching between substitutes? What's their behavior? Do they say, okay, yeah. if I can't get this fish, I can switch to this other fish. You know, that's what they, yeah. and they're comfortable with it. I've seen some people say, look, if I can't find chama rice, I'll switch to mongo rice or I'll switch to Thai rice. <laughs> I've seen some people say, uh, no, me, I can't touch mongo rice. I can't touch, I like Thai rice. I've seen people say that. So if your customers are sticky to that specific thing, then they're less likely to go to sub. So you need to know their behavior. Uh, what is the relative price in performance of yours of the substitutes? Are the substitutes getting cheaper? What is the perceived level of differentiation? Are you very different from these substitutes? You know, yeah. people will know that, okay, these are just very cheap substitutes. We can only use them temporarily. And what's the switching cost to the substitutes? So it's between the customer going to another competitor. Do they know? Does uh, do they do you have few customers? 
who have the power to switch between competitors? Do you have a lot of substitutes? And then the third one is bargaining power with your suppliers. Remember now, this is inbound logistics. So I started first. So I started with the outbound logistics. Yeah, <laughs> no, it is. So this is the inbound logistics. How many vendors do you have? Do you have options? If you only have one supplier, that supplier will price you a lot. They'll price you strongly. But if you have many yeah. options, you can then you can then negotiate your suppliers and move to the cheaper ones. So are you dealing with a lot of suppliers? Are you dealing with high costs? What is the uniqueness of each supplier? Is this supplier a quality guarantee? So therefore, if you switch, you start to sacrifice the quality of your product, which might sacrifice the quality of what you're delivering to your customer. Ask the questions. And what is the focal, what is the focal company's ability to substitute you as the person? What is your ability to substitute between you and your suppliers? Can you substitute suppliers? suppliers very easily. Um, if you're producing juice, can you substitute between juice from Zambia sugar or, ju- I mean, sorry, sugar from Zambia sugar or sugar from Kasama sugar? Can you switch between yeah. those two? Or do yeah. you exactly need what Zambia sugar gives you? It meets your specifications. That is what we mean. As you Are you able to switch between them and their competitors? Uh, and that's, yeah. the, that's a key point. Then the other thing that fights you now in the industry is rivalry. You have to look at rivalry with the current people. In other words, how many competitors do you have? How diverse are they? How concentrated? How much power do the people who are at the top of the industry have? How much much is the industry growing? If it's growing slowly, it's very difficult to add big margins. Slow growing industries become difficult to add margins. What's the difference in quality? If your difference in quality, whether you're bigger, better, faster, the difference is not that great, then you're going to struggle to to justify a bigger margin. Because if your customer is charging 10, you want to charge 15 that extra five what is it for in the customer's mind uh, versus your versus your competitor if your competitor is charging 10 you're charging 15 what is the difference between you and your competitor that justifies that and wh- how difficult is it for people to exit that also makes it uh, difficult for people to enter and the switching costs between customers and finally there's always new people who can come into your industry okay always remember that what's the threat of new people are there barriers to entry like regulations do 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 regulators put licensing fees that are really high remember i always say people one of the things that causes inflation is regulators blocking people from entering uh, are there yeah. economies of scale if they're no, if they're economies of scale in your industry then you are able then then you are able to win because you've already established those economies and it'll take people growing to be able to compete with you and to get the profit margins you can is there brand loyalty Brand loyalty makes it difficult. So this is why they tell you, don't go for cheap. Build brand loyalty, which is emotional. And people build brand loyalty to things they find bigger, better, faster, stronger, simpler. Those are where brand loyalty comes in. Okay? Profit maximization is where they're just looking for something that's cheaper. Don't just be the cheaper option. Be the brand loyal option. Is your your industry highly capital intensive or getting to your position? Are you have you have you accumulated a lot of experience? I've accumulated yeah. 12 years of experience in my industry yeah. and I've accumulated seven years of experience as a licensed practitioner. It makes it very difficult for somebody to get to my point. OK, and then you've got Shadrach, who's been in there for a long time as well, who's also accumulated a lot of experience understanding people. People become more comfortable dealing with experienced practitioners. And therefore, that's why we can that's a barrier to entry for them. Is it needed? Are there government policies that prohibit people from getting into there that make it very difficult? Access to distribution channels. Is it difficult to get distribution channels? Let me give you an example with uh, retail outlets. In Zambia, big businesses who are, who, are, who, are big, who are big in these industries, the big manufacturers, have got control of shelf space at places like ShopRite and those yeah. places. If you're a small business, you will barely get there. They'll ask you for too much and they'll pay you at bad times. So getting to those distribution channels and getting favorable treatment is very difficult for the small person. So sometimes more small, most small manufacturers, what do they do? They start by distributing to Kantembas and people who are selling on the streets first and then gain the market there before they go to ShopRite so that they've already got a wider distribution network aside from getting there. These are studies that we've done in the industries knowing these things. So if you understand this model, all of these things affect, and I'm just going to go back here, All of these things, and I'm just bringing this part back, all of these things affect your ability to enhance this part. Sorry, let me just bring this back. 
Yes, to enhance this part of your business, the margin. Because the key yeah. you want is yeah. the margin. This is your profit. This is why you are in yeah. business. Okay? You want to make a profit. You want to make an impact. Yes. But you truly can only sustain that by making a profit. And that you're power, not an those powers... Yeah, you're not a philanthropist. Yeah. So the key you're looking for is to make sure you can widen this margin as much as possible. And you can only do it by ticking those things, making sure you're hard to substitute, uh, spreading out the, buy the, the the buyers. If you start saying, I'm just going to supply to government only, if you're, if you're like, if you're doing loans and you'll say, I'm only supplying to the government, the day the government fails to pay you, your loan business will go underground. Okay. If the government is your only client and the government fails to pay you on time, your loan business will be shut down. And and and, and Munyumba, Munyumba just is okay, guys. Uh, looks like we have lost Munyumba. Uh, so now I'm very quickly. So sorry about that. Oh, yeah. Um, no, so no. now we've we've come back on the onto this part of margin. The key you want to do is you want to develop margin. Okay. To yeah. everyone there, that's your number one core here. You need to develop margin. So Shadrach, sorry, I went through all of that in terms of Porter's five forces. Uh, what yeah. are your what's your point on this point of of um, making sure that you analyze your, your environment in order to be able to add your margin and to justify your value. So your value, your margin, and your and your activities, your primary activities. Yeah, Nyumba, Nyumba, this, is, this is the same thing that I'm talking about. And I did, I did also quote from Susan's book. She says, if you can, wow your customers when you provide, a higher price seems to be justified. And I like how you brought out the, the, the Porter's Five Forces, all right? But because now, these are the real issues that are happening in the industry, guys. These are the real issues right now. If you want to make it, you need to understand those issues. And then let me just show you uh, the other side. Numbers as, as explain this in this, 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 uh, these issues. But I want, I want to show you how you can navigate these issues to ensure you survive, all right? You want to fight. So Numbers explain to you uh, potential interests, as explain to you suppliers, uh, competitive rivalry, buyers. All these people have control over you. For example, we're talking about buyers, you know, and suppliers. The supplier aspect is a very painful aspect, but because you know, look at Coca Cola, they dictate how much to sell their 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 their, their, their you know bottle of uh, uh, Coke at. Look at uh, MTN, Airtel, Zamto, they dictate how much profit they're going to make from selling to them. Look at the Post newspapers, the mass newspapers, Daily Nation, all these guys, they dictate the, the the prices for you. So now, how do you navigate? How do you make money out of this kind of hostile environment where they are, you know, they, they are threats from potential entrants? They are, you know, buyers have too much bargaining power. Some buyers would even say, "What? I'm going to take my business elsewhere." Mm -hmm. I, 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 I read the story of a man in Mumbai who had ten million dollars in the bank, and then one day he just woke up and said, "What? I'm going. I, I need, I need my money to put with a different bank." And the bank manager knelt down to plead with this man, right? Because yeah. we're having. One, one big client. Now, one big client impairs your judgment also. Uh, we, we teach that in advanced or at the master's level. A very big client has a potential to impair your judgment. So don't want to depend so much on one client, all right? One buyer. Can you have different buyers? So now, how do you navigate, all right? There are substitutes coming in. So there's, there's everyone is, is, is fighting you. Everyone is trying to compete with you. So how do you survive in this hostile competitive environment? So there are a few things that you need to do. To navigate uh, this presentation here. So now, if you look at this, one of the solutions to use IT. So I want to explain to you guys the impact of IT on each of those Porter's five forces. Let me remember from explaining to you. For example, he talks about uh, the library. All right. Now, how do you use IT to navigate through that and just succeed? You have to use IT to reduce the effect of tough competition. How? I'm going to give an example. Uh, let's say you, you need. You're in the uh, tourism industry. So a tour, tour operators can compare their price competitiveness by accessing the websites of other providers on, on, on the internet according to see our prices. How competitive are they in comparison to other people? What, what IT does, it saves you the time to begin to carry out a survey and stuff like that. Just go to the website and check out how much our friends selling at. So you can see the competitor. That saves you time and energy in terms of research and development. In terms of research. It tend to, you know, uh, cutting out surveys and paying people commissions, it saves you that. So it gives you an advantage. Looking at your suppliers' prices from the, from some websites, can you help with for now? Can I put my prices? But again, look at the threat of new entrants. How can you use IT to navigate that? Of course, we know, guys, that um, sophisticated IT applications are expensive, and some, most more often than not, they are slow to develop. 
But whilst these are challenging things to do, if you look at the good side of IT, IT reduces distribution costs for other industries. All right? For example, I, I am a lecturer myself. All right? I, technology has helped me to reduce the mode of delivery. I used to meet my, my students physically. Now I don't meet them physically. I have students in the UK, in India, Mauritius, Uganda, uh, Botswana. I have students all in all those places. How come? Because I'm using technology. It has helped me to deliver remotely in different places. So can you leverage IT to survive these hostile economic environments? But again, look at um, uh, a good example is MP3. MP3 guys has created a systemic shift in the music industry by penetrating at a very low cost into an online distribution channel compared to its brick and mortar competitors. Have you seen? So now IT is help you solve a problem because now you have all these, you have all these, uh, you, you have all these uh, sub suppliers who are powerful, potential entrants, you have uh, stronger buyers, a lot of service too. So how do you survive in this hostile economic environment? We need to leverage IT. Number three, how do you uh, have a supplier power? So I've talked about number one, the rivalry. Number two, the threats of new entrants, all right? And then number three, supplier power. How do you navigate the supplier power? Of course, one of them is increased knowledge of the market through the internet has increased the bargaining power of consumers. Now, guys, you cannot tell me that uh, a iPhone 14 is 500,000, because I will refuse. Because I can simply go to eBay or go to Amazon, search for the price, and they know the price. So, so IT has given has, has, has moved power away from suppliers to ask the buyers because now we know the prices. So when you use IT to navigate through other websites and see how much they are charging, it's going to help you to understand how much you should charge so that you can compete favorably. But also threats of substitutes. Using, using computer-aided design and manufacturers to develop new products first is key for you to succeed in this area. But because, like, like, like I was telling you guys, from the time I started, I was one of the few people to lecture online in accounting students. Now we have a lot of people, but what has kept me uh, almost on top of the business is partly because I've made use of what of technology. Technology helps. So, so can you make you use of technology, it. but you also master, master the art? I have mastered the art of teaching. If you come to my classes, people that so come I'm saying you've mastered the technology. Today, You've mastered, yeah, mastered the technology. technology. Other people are making mistakes. You know how to use it perfectly. I know how to use it. Anytime you call me midnight, now I speak at high profile events. I train directors, all right? But because I know how to use these things. So guys, while the, the economic environment is so hostile, you can still compete. You can still survive. But one thing you can't do is what Munyumba said, all right? Do not go for cheaper. There is always somebody who can afford you. Last week, I was telling you about uh, the clients I had, I, I had. And one of them was a young lady. Uh, the father called me. Somebody recommended this young lady. Somebody recommended me to this man. He calls me, tells me what? My daughter um, uh, is having challenges. She's uh, with SCCA. And she's having an exam the next two weeks. All right. So I, I tell him, okay, fine. Um, I'm busy, but I'm, I, can, I can do with your daughter for 10 days. And I charged him some amount of money. This man paid me. 10 days we learned with the daughter. Yesterday, uh, two days ago, she sat for exams. And you know, SEC exams, the moment you, yeah. you sit for exams, the same day you see the results. She passed, she calls me, sir, passed, she was very excited, all right? So the man sees that there's value in the, the service I offer to the daughter. What does he do? He tells me, you know what? The moment, now that she's happy, she's excited, I want her to continue with the same momentum. So now I'm going to get more business. This man's going to recommend me to other people with children who are having problems passing SCCA. All right. So that's how you create uh, relationships. Can you deliver? Once you deliver, I don't have to advertise to this man. Susan does not have to give me money to advertise to me. No. I have seen the value Susan brings into my life. I have seen what she does into my, my, my sales life. I don't have to go and uh, wait for an advert from my page. No. I can tell somebody about this book because I know the value. So I bought it because Shadrach around. told me. No, here's yeah, an example. Bought I bought book. it because Shadrach told me. I bought three yeah. of her books because Shadrach told me. And then I went and got them and I experienced it the same. And I wrote about it on yeah. my page. This, this yeah. is exactly how it works, people. And I, I needed it, so I bought it. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it works. So, guys, what, 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 what the value, you can even see from what we are giving you the value in this conversation. You can tell that you need to understand economics before you can begin to the uh, investing. Something but over to you. So now just to kind of wind this up, I wanted to do, I'm doing something here called a case study. 
okay? And yeah. I'm going to utilize this, and I want you all to pay attention. I'm going to give you a case study on Zambief and Zambia Sugar as to how their value chains differ and what margins and how margins improve for one. Now, here's the first thing I can tell you. Zambief, or sorry, Zambia Sugar actually had bigger profit margins, has bigger profit margins than Zambief. Zambia Sugar has got 19% profit margins, while Zambief has about 4 5% profit margins. And the question everyone asks is why? Why does Zambia Sugar have such bigger profit margins while Zambief has smaller profit margins, yet they're both agri-processing companies? Uh, shouldn't they be somewhere around the standard? So here's some of the realities that you'll find out in some of the history. Uh, the first thing I can tell you is when you go to Zambia Sugar uh, in terms of this, and yes, I'll be able to wind this up, please, just by the way, people, we will be getting to this. Um, if you look at Zambief, well, Zambia Sugar, you will find that in their inbound logistics of sugar production, the sugar you buy, in this inbound logistics, Zambia Sugar owns their inbound logistics. They own the sugarcane plantations. They own those Mazabuka sugar fields. So they actually grow their own sugar that feeds into their own operations. So one thing you can do, if your business is simple, okay, and this is a big if, if your business is simple and you have worked out this, the, the customer's needs, make sure you first understand the customer's needs very well. Then you are able to produce. If you're able to do that to increase your margins, what you can do and remove the power of your producers, you can buy your inbound logistics and own it. So owning the sugar plantation gives Zambia Sugar a higher margin. Now, Zambief tried this. Zambief tried to buy out dairy farms so that they could now start producing milk. They bought out farms to have their own cattle. They have had chicken runs. They had everything. They've got so much. And what happened to Zambief? Zambief was making losses. They were going into debt. Yeah. So why did this work for Zambia Sugar? And why did it fail for Zambief in this one? And the biggest part of this case study is very simple. Zambia Sugar has a single product. Zambief yeah, had yeah. diverse products. Zambief yeah. had many things that they were doing. So they were yeah. trying to produce cooking oil. That time they even bought Amanita. They were busy buying all sorts of things. <laughs> now, each of these yeah. things required so much. Every single yeah. one of them required so much. It required managers. So handling beef, handling cows requires a different manager to handling chickens, which requires a different manager to handling dairy cows, which requires different managers to handling eggs, to handling milk, to handling this. So all these things required different managers, different this, and it became huge on the costs of Zambief. Because Zambief is one of the biggest producers of beef. So what was the problem? So what Zambief has started doing is they've started getting rid of ownership in inbound logistics. So they actually started selling this off because Zambia yeah. learned a very important trick. You don't only have to own the inbound logistics. You can use Porter's Five Forces to be the biggest buyer of your suppliers. And therefore, you have control over their prices. So in as much as yeah. Zambief has sold off and said, all the small cattle, guy, you guys go ahead and go and hurt. You guys give us, you feed us with the cattle. We'll slaughter them and we'll handle the cold chain. So we'll do the processing and outbound logistics all the way to service. This part we will do. Now, some companies don't even do that. Some companies, Shadrach, even just go up to here to the sales and marketing yeah. and they outsource to other companies, yeah. smaller companies. Some companies only do this part, outsource, and then they inbound. So you must yeah. know where are the parts you are the most efficient? Where are you bigger, better, faster, stronger? And you don't have to adopt unnecessary risks like we talked about before. So what Zambief has done is they've sold this part off. And now guess what has happened to Zambief? Their profits have increased. The share value of the company has gone up. The margins have gone up. So they're actually growing again as a company. And now they're even trying to raise $100 million to improve because they have learned due to the diversity of their products, they have no business owning the inbound logistics because it creates unnecessary cost, which thins their margin. And then the moment there happens to be any problem, like last time where you had that, um, that problem with Zambief, where the, where, that problem with the weather, when you started having the drought, the moment they faced that, all of a sudden, the, the, their whole margins got eroded. Zambief had about 3% uh, profit yeah. margins. Net profits were 3%, while Zambia Sugar had about 17 to 19% of profit margins. So even inflation, when it affects them, it doesn't hit them as badly. And both of them have got equal pricing power.
Okay, both of them are both big in the industry, but this one had a necessary cost. So this why I, this is the lesson I want to give you about inbound logistics. If you're yeah. doing diverse products, be very careful about trying to own your inbound logistics. It will become yeah. a huge managerial cost to you. And we yeah. knew this because yeah. as a stock market analyst, this is something we picked up on as to why this company had to start going through cost rationalization. So what the new CEO, Faith Mukutu, has been assigned to do and improve the company. One more simple thing I'll just give you as an example quickly about pricing power. Uh, about having the power to dictate your pricing to your suppliers. I once dealt with a juice manufacturer who was dealing with the fact that the bigger juice manufacturers were buying sugar from Zambia Sugar and some of the suppliers at, at lower prices. But Zambia Sugar was then charging the bigger ones higher price, the smaller ones higher prices because of economies of scale. So now what happens is these smaller manufacturers could not come in cheaper OK, because they could not access sugar cheaper because sugar makes up half the price of the juice concentrate that you purchase. So that's just some of it that we just wanted to just uh, put into there as an example of sometimes why you can't do it because of your control of the purchasing power. So you must understand your value model. OK, and your and your 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 five forces model to be able to dictate your price and your margin and therefore to be able to run a sustainable business and grow your margin so that you can grow your profits so that you can grow your business. And that's just a, yeah. a live example I wanted to give as many people as possible in this. There's much more we can give. We understand. But Shadrach, I hand it to you. What are your thoughts on those case studies as we wind up here? Remember, it's, it's the same thing we mentioned as we started, that this first box here, the inbound logistics, is one of the most important boxes that you have to understand because that's when you are starting. That is the that's the critical success factor, right? You can't succeed if you mess up that part because that's the part that that gives you a lot of costs, right? And 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 mm -hmm. looking at uh, uh, the the model that we talked about earlier, we talked about uh, the the portal five forces. And let me just bring one thing that that I did not mention. Now, there's one thing that I did not mention, Mumba here. When you talked about the five forces, how you can navigate a uh, stronger, sub, uh, stronger supplier, you know, uh, bargaining power. We said mm. if you have a very stronger supplier, all right, some suppliers are so strong that they dictate how much money you make. Like I said, uh, you can talk about Coca Cola, you know, MTN, Airtel, Zamtel, these are uh, uh, mass newspaper. They, all these guys are stronger suppliers. They dictate how much money you make when you buy from them. Now, you don't want that. That's very painful, all right. So how do you navigate and make more money, all right? Use IT. And number four says supplier power. Number three, you have to increase access to different suppliers. This is going to help to decrease the power of the current suppliers that you have. So can you begin to look for other ways of how you can access the same product or something similar from other suppliers? Because one supplier is going to just hold you, you know, uh, hold you to a thread and you can't breathe. Because they are dictating how much money you make. See, people also talk them. They go to buy a lot of talk them. They make two kwacha. Uh, for maybe, maybe for after saying is it 50 kwacha or whatever it is, small amounts of money. So looking at what Minyumba has been able to say here, Zambia has been able to be successful now because they've understood something here. Um, Minyumba, please bring back that diagram. Okay, there we go. Good. Okay, yeah. yes. They have understood that this part here, the inbound logistics, was something that was taking them down. So what have they done? They focused on what is now working for them, and they are now succeeding. So you want to do better on the first part there, the inbound logistics. So I remember mean, saying earlier, we said, guys, if you can do well on sales and marketing, these other things are going to fall in line. The first, can you sell something that is already made? So once you are, once you have enough experience, all right, then you cannot begin to do your own things. A lot of us we fail because we want to leave what is already working for what is possible. No. First of all, master what is working. I have mastered something that I that I work with. No matter how much how much I experiment doing other businesses, remember, I still get back and make money because I've mastered some that gives me money already. So my experiments, even, even if I make losses, I have something that's already working for me. This is the part you have to get very well as you're starting, guys. Inbound logistics. And I think we've we've done a fantastic job here, Mnumba. We've explained and um, our fantastic audience has been supportive. We've seen a number of comments. Remember, um, there are some names, though, that I wanted to just uh, bring to your attention. I keep seeing these names every now and then, you know. Some names have become like family here. You know, I keep seeing yes. Francesca. Francesca is like a family member here, all right? 
I keep seeing mm. Francesca, you know, she's it's always I, we see names Mwila, you know, uh Wombasi came. John, yeah. These guys are amazing. We keep seeing guys, we appreciate your participation, we appreciate you supporting us. Philip, thank you so very much. Um, anything else from you? Please, by the way, um, give us your feedback on today's session. Was it helpful? I know some of you would like the charts um, that are there. I'll be putting them up on my on my um, on my page as well, and I'll share them with Shadrach as well. So these are just some models for you just to look at as well. These are things to think about, but work with professionals, people. When you're trying to implement these things, also work with professionals who understand these things and can help you implement these things into your products or study them so that you become a professional very well in these things. All right, guys, it takes a lot more and it takes practice. But yes, thank you very much, Jimmy. That was an example that we wanted to give you as to how to actually apply it and to understand it. Um, to everyone, I give you those are my final words. This today has been about creating value and always remember your customer is not going to pay for the price they are going to pay for the value they are getting for the yeah. price okay that's yeah. what we call bang for buck so make sure your customer gets the value do all these activities and uh, deliver the highest value and simply uh, sorry one thing out before i forget uh two things sorry one simplify your value chain simplify yeah. it if you're making less than a million kwacha don't make life complicated by adding too many products too many of you people yeah. make too many products in your business and then you start complicating your lives your inbound logistics become very expensive because you diversify too early and you hurt yourself so make sure you do you do one thing very well to the point where you get that skill because if you can sell a lot even your you've now got power over your suppliers so if you sell a lot of your product, you actually have power. So simplify your business and get very good at it. Number two, outsource where you can. Negotiate and build relationships and outsource. I am not a chartered accountant. I work with Shadrach because I understand he's got much better skills. Why should I go and start learning to become one when I have access to one and I can infuse them into my services so that we can have a better premium service okay, or a better premium show? So outsource where you can, okay? Collaborate with people where you can and stick to where you are very strong and therefore you, you will give a superior product and your customer will be comfortable paying the higher price for the value that you are offering, especially at the beginning. And that's where I'll leave it for now. Fantastic. So guys, uh, we have a class coming up. If you want to uh, enroll, Bonjugation is going on and there's a family finance coming up and personal finance in January. So we advertise our classes months before for uh we don't want to do yeah. what, the opposite of what we preach we advertise in advance that you prepare generally the class going on for family finance for couples to improve your financial lives and possibly strengthen the chains of love it is only 700 kwacha all right so if you want to enroll the slots are already moving guys our classes get full very fast right now the, the, the general class is moving version is going to be full so if you want to be part of that class for january for family finance uh, please feel free to WhatsApp or contact that number that we have just shared there on the screen. There's a number that we have shared. Feel free to... Um, uh, where's that number? Okay, yeah. Okay, yes. Feel free yeah, to call no, that number, guys. In the comment section, yeah. Yeah, feel free yeah. to call that number and in your for uh, family finance and personal finance. Fa personal finance is 500 kwacha. Family finance is 700 uh, kwacha. January, guys. The slots are moving already. Please uh, call that number and register. Bond education is going. Is uh, number when are we having the next bond education class? It is now. We are now officially uh, doing bond education as uh, what you call self-paced. So we have actually started yeah. the process of transitioning to self-paced bond education, and we've just been testing it out. So you are able to contact this line below. Uh, you can actually join the current group. Videos are now set out for you to be able to learn at the pace that you want. You can now continue and the tools are then handed to you later. We will be doing a big transition very, very soon. We'll be making a big announcement for that. So for Bond Education, please contact that number. Uh, we'll be able to now work with you. It is 500 kwacha. Uh, for it, remember that you get 15 lessons that take you through the emotions of money, technical and tactical of how to understand money and investment and the actual tactical uh, plan that you're able to deploy and also get a hold of your 
of your investment tools. There are two spreadsheets that come with it with a workbook that will come at the end. We're actually rolling those out now and they'll be prepared for you also at the end so that you'll be able to do them. That is all coming in the price of 500 kwacha only for this period. Uh, before we start doing our readjustments, before we actually change it, we are changing Bondication to a now even more enhanced system and we'll be rolling out even more services. So thank you to everyone. Contact that line 972 462 892 and we'll be able to assist you. Fantastic. Okay. So thank you very much, guys. We appreciate thank you to you everyone. We are participation. Go and enjoy the World Cup to everyone. We know that okay. now it's time for all of you to go. How, how do you say bye in French? How do you say bye in French? How do you say bye in French? Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs> Au revoir. Fantastic. All right, guys. Au revoir. See you all. <laughs> Have a wonderful day.